we are in a battle <clears throat> and we're partly in a battle for resilience and you know the words everywhere as though we are going to get to a resilient place or it, as though there's a, a real place of sustainability um, to me we're in a process of defining resilient but resilience by our action it's not really an end place or a destination it's a it's a process um, and we're not going back to a normal that we've lived in before uh, COVID, partly because there's so much that needs to change and so much opportunity in what we're going through. But um, let me just review a little bit about what, you know, I'm, I'm no more an expert on COVID than any of you, uh, but some of the observations I'd make from, from all the conversations and all that, that we hear. You know, we've seen 58 deaths, thousands of victims, we're, we're looking at um, an already divided America destabilized. We're looking at parents working from home with the stress of concern for their children and their children's well being, their children's stimulation. At the same time, they're trying to run a business or serve others um, online. We're looking at businesses, restaurants closing, the dairy industry losing $90 million in two months and then having $20 million in losses paid back by the state. It's like, these economic wedges that are coming into uh, our, our reality are really tough for a lot of people. A lot of us are being paid. I'm personally getting paid regardless, um, but a lot of people aren't. And a lot of people are going through significant suffering and contention. When, when all this started, we were looking at two to three months, a window where like, like many of the European countries, we would respond rationally and effectively to the COVID crisis and we come out the other side. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, we're looking at impacts on historically marginalized people, people of color, low income people, much greater than on the rest of us. That's a fundamental challenge. Meanwhile, the stock market's booming, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. We're looking at this tremendous pressure on everyone so that we are, and all of you we're planning as with great determination and great energy to do everything we possibly can to respond effectively at the same time we're planning for something that we have no idea <laughs> are we going to get a you know is there going to be a, a, a an answer to covid in six months in two months um, are we going to have kids coming back out of school all those additional pressures whether the stock market's going to survive uh, an electoral shift whether democracy is going to survive in a strong way. All these pressures put stresses on us. So meanwhile, we have mental health implications. We have depression. We have alcohol overuse. We're seeing opioid deaths um, going up, suicides, and even automobile fatalities going up significantly right now. So I'm telling you all the dark side because it's real, it's fundamental, and it's a lever. But meanwhile, we're seeing neighborliness, local action groups, neighbors helping neighbors, food supports, neighbors checking in on each other, mask making, everyone's ready to pitch in. We're seeing arts events online, in communities, in new distancing ways. We're seeing businesses and downtowns opening up in really creative ways. We're seeing children who are resilient and are running around and having a blast. They don't care. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not going to be too badly hurt, we hope. Um, we're seeing the deep collaboration between people who are on the line in their agencies, in their businesses, and in government that are working effectively together. We're also seeing a new recognition of the absolute necessity of racial justice, um, overcoming privileges, taking responsibility as individuals and organizations and the imperative of systems change. Because one of the great things that we're finding is we are in a catalytic crucible. We're not going back to normal. We don't choose our time, but aren't we lucky to live in a time of existential purposiveness where our efforts are late, lent greater urgency, greater power, to go beyond short-term thinking and short-term tactics and incrementalism, our job is really to seize this day, leverage from this moment and look to transformational impact for the good of our society. So there's lessons in COVID. The first is to pay attention to science. If we were paying good attention to science, we would have been probably out the window on the other side of COVID 
right now, at least for the year. Um, we also know from science that you have to be resilient, not to the last threat, but to the next. We went through Irene, we learned a lot about neighborliness and um, breaking rules to get things done. Um, and we're always gonna need to be vigilant for viral mutation and pandemics. They're actually always with us. It's part of the story of world history and we should have been better prepared and we, we hopefully will be in the future. But we also need to be prepared for cyber terrorism, for an attack on the grid or the internet, which is probably likely within our lifetimes. And then we have the reality that science is showing us in a very determined um, and practical way the cat catastrophic cascading impacts of climate change that are going to happen with our lifetimes and are actually happening today with the fires out west, the drying out of the Agalala uh, aquifer under the Midwest, the rising tides in seawater when we have storms, and the fact that we're seeing this in microcosm in this country, but Europe and Asia are looking at places where um, we are living beyond the uh, ecosystem uh, services of particular places in terms of the population that won't be sustainable in the same way in a time of greater upheaval based on climate change. So we know this and, and it's a, it becomes an imperative to us in terms of both morally as a civilization, as a civic democracy, and also as a place that looks to our strong economic future. You know, to me, the the immediate lessons of uh, COVID are saying that we um, urgently need universal broadband. Everyone's agreeing on that. We need to also think about broadband that doesn't do two things, that, that broadband and, and digital alone does. Digital lets us buy through Amazon from anywhere in the world, but it doesn't necessarily spur local commerce. And this digital also lets us go into worlds of like-minded people where we're insulated from the combat of ideas and the, the play of uh, humanity that we need to be better integrated into. And we need to look at, as we look at universal systems for broadband in Vermont, which I think is gonna come in the next two to three years, we need to also be looking at the parallel needs for buy local commerce online that connects us more closely to our communities and the structures of democracy like Front Porch Forum taken to another level that helps us integrate our work, connect to our neighbors, work as teams more effectively and empowers rather than undermines local democracy. Um, I think those are fundamental. I think universal and affordable childcare is going to be fundamental to our successful future and we're going to need to just choose to pay. So we're gonna look at some transformational big picture things. We're not gonna let people who are homeless today and we've taken care of in, in housing, we're not, we're not gonna bring them back to the streets. We're not gonna let the 345 families that were homeless before COVID go back. Um, we've gotta do better than that. So we're gonna need to look at different ways of generating uh, dollars. We're gonna need to look at an economic transformation and we need to be looking at all that right now. Um, we need to be looking at the relocalization of agriculture you know, we're the most dependent on one commodity in the United States, who would milk. We're not competing well for the bottom of the international economy. Our best thing is to compete for the top of the creative economy around dairy, around value added products, both for the forest products and the agricultural side. Do that at scale. Let's invest in innovation. Let's support um, enterprises that are doing creative new models. Let's look at regenerative agriculture and let's be a leader in that in investing our carbon in the soil so that we're improving soils as we answer climate change effectively. We have a dramatic opportunity to be the, the not just the milk bowl of New England, but the bread basket, cheese board and, uh, and vegetable platter of New England. So let's seize the day and let's make money doing so and encourage young families to live in Vermont. We also have an opportunity around the remote destination. We all know the pressure that's coming right now in the real estate market with people buying high-end homes in the hills. A lot of those people will bring jobs and children with them, both needed here, and are also going to bring an innovative edge. We need to welcome them, but at the same time, we need to be looking to how we diversify the folks that naturally come to Vermont. You gotta hand it to Southern Vermont folks that are looking diligently 
How do we make Vermont more welcoming to people of color? How do we tell our story in a new way? How do we think of what, what it takes to welcome people and include them day one? So you don't have to be here for six generations or be born here to be a real Vermonter. You're a real Vermonter because you're contributing, because you bring energy, because you bring creativity. Um, and we've all got a lot of work to do around that. Um, we also have a relocalization that's possible around the climate economy and energy development. Um, we're in, living in a world that, you know, what do businesses do? They solve problems and they make money by solving problems. And when you think about the intersection between the environment and humanity, it's the wedge of the economy. So changing the economy is the way that you answer climate change and other fundamental shifts, engaging the most creative people to think of ways to make dollars doing the right thing. There's gonna be a massive economic competition. And in fact, it's already around us. Um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, San Francisco, Mumbai. They're not just trying to invent the next chip for computing. They're trying to invent the electric airplane, the, the next Tesla. They're trying to invent paints that gather electrons so that every surface can be contributing. We have a distributed grid uh, mentality in Vermont that's new with all of our utilities engaged in this thinking. Our grid managers who used to think about a big utility here and the homeowner there and that they were one-way traffic. They're facilitators of a, a, they're in a sea change where they're, they're facilitators of the interconnectivity of all kinds of devices in an intelligent grid where everyone's contributing and everyone's using power in a, a really radical new way. We can take that to scale in Vermont. And there's a lot of business surrounding how we do that from battery storage businesses to grid innovators to new generation um, that those who seize leadership are going to capture market share and are going to be the economic winners. Vermont should be one of those places. We should model the climate economy for rural America. We're geared up to do it. Um, so, you know, I'm talking a lot about the economy. The other, the other side is really our Vermont community. And I think one of the essential principles we need to be working on is the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and particularly the immigration side of that. But we really need to think about kind of adding it up. You know, we, we, we go into communities at VCRD and you see the select board that's besieged by problem statements. And you see individuals who come in and lay in a problem. And, you know, at VCRD, we, we always say the same things. We say, you know, don't wait for Washington DC to come to your community with a vision for your future. Don't wait for Montpelier to set the direction for the future of your economy. Um, we're looking at this economic situation that divides us, this division between wealth and poverty, the division between the two Vermonts, people who really like the, the freedom side of the Vermont motto and others who really like the unity side of the Vermont model. And sometimes they're not connecting in small towns anymore. And we also see people who are eager and energetic and are taking leadership and others who uh, don't necessarily participate. And making democracy real for the next generation is going to be fundamental. We're looking at an election that's going to challenge us. We're looking at this online dialogue and news cycle that is, um, it, it's, it's very defeatist in lots of ways. You hear people going around sharing, um, sharing the list of problems and then adding to it and feeling bad. <laughs> and you also see uh, people in our culture where so many movies are about uh, the destruction of Ragnarok or zombie apocalypse or whatever all. And we are amused by these uh, kind of games of the last stage of things. But we're, we're telling that story to our children. 
we're telling our story that we don't that we're telling a story sometimes that we don't have ideals and principles that we don't believe that our ideals and principles are going to succeed that we don't really know where we're going or we're actually telling our kids sometimes that we're heading towards the end of times and i've heard children 10 year old children say you know that they expect the end of the world and this is totally unacceptable it's time for us as a society and us as individuals to be the adults in the room step up speak with faith and confidence provide what ted brady calls relentless optimism and carry others with us in faith that we have the power to make the difference and to win the day. And we have to take that spirit up right now because we're not going to be building the better Vermont with little increments in our time. This next year is going to test us and we need to step up and think big about getting big things done. So that's my challenge to everybody and sorry to be all preachy and everything. Um, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity to think with you and also what, a, what an honor it is to have an opportunity to share um, some of my reflections with people I so deeply respect and uh, whose work matters so, so much to me and to Vermont. So thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate that. And um, I forgot to mention when I introduced Paul that Paul has also been chairing um, the governor's local solutions and community action team. So. Um, I think we're lucky to have your leadership and to have you thinking so comprehensively about the future of the state. Um, and it's a really uh, a great way to frame this discussion to really encourage us as we're thinking about the future to to think big and think about what Vermont can be and what we can do into the future. So appreciate it. I also really love the image of being the cheese board of New England. <laughs> we should start an ad campaign. <laughs> um, well, great. Well, thanks so much, Paul. And uh, moving on, we're going to start to really dive into what the data tells us. So we thought it would be useful to frame this conversation and ground it in some facts around what have we really seen? How has this um, pandemic affected our economy? What have the impacts been? And um, what are some projections as we look into the future and how should we be thinking about tracking um, recovery as we move ahead? So um, we have Kevin Stapleton with us from the Department of Labor. Kevin, thanks for joining. I'll hand it over to you and um, I believe you should be able to share your screen if you have some images to share. Hello everybody, let me screen share part figured out and we'll, uh, we'll tackle this. So uh, first of all, thanks to Jenna and everybody for uh, inviting me along. And it's hard to talk after uh, Mr. Costello because there's such a sort of 30,000 feet broad view of Vermont in uh, his discussion. And we are in the Economic and Labor Market Information Division. We are sort of at the other end of that. We have a uh, very particular focus on the economy in Vermont and the way the economy in Vermont is right now. Uh, what I want to do is take a few minutes just to share some, some thoughts, some data that we have related to the Vermont economy. Um, and I want to encourage you, if I can get my screen, I can't seem to get the, hold on just a second, I'm trying to get the chat box up on my screen as well. There it goes. Yeah. So um, I have the chat box open here, so if a question comes up during the presentation, I typically say raise your hand, but that won't work very well here. So if you have any questions or anything while I'm talking, please just uh, distract me in the chat box and I will attempt to monitor that as we're talking here. I encourage and Kevin, you. Kevin, I'll just cut in this really quick. If people use the raise hands function on Zoom, I can, I'll see that and I can send oh. those questions your way too. Oh, perfect. If okay. you don't mind me cutting in while you're talking. No, not at all. Please, anybody okay. interrupt at any time. And we'll leave some time for questions at the end as well. But uh, first of all, just a very brief background. Uh, what is this thing, the Economic and Labor Market Information Division of the Vermont Department of Labor? Uh, we are the smallest division in the Department of Labor. We are funded by the federal government uh, to produce and disseminate economic data about the state, uh, primarily focused on the labor market. 
And uh, things like if you see the monthly unemployment rate, which until about six months ago was uh, a really boring statistic for most people, uh, when you see that published, that's the kind of data we're producing. What types of industries people work in. Uh, for your purposes, what might be most interesting is that we have a lot of sub-state data, uh, town level data, regional, county, labor market area level data. If you're working in uh, small communities around the state, we have a decent amount of uh, economic information about each one of those communities and we're always happy to share it or uh, talk to you about what we have. But today I just wanna look at broadly what has happened since the pandemic. Um, but before we go there, I think it's important to stay grounded in the fact that the, the pandemic is, a, is a, a business cycle event. It obviously goes without saying it caused a recession, but the problems, the long-term secular problems, concerns that existed before this all started will still be there even if and when we recover all of the jobs from the pandemic, which that's an open question. But um, so I wanna take a quick look at one of the, the biggest concerns people around the state have, and that is our labor force. Uh, the labor force is just all of the people who are employed plus all the people who are unemployed. And in recent years and decades, uh, in certain parts of the state it has been getting smaller. And what I have here is just a graphic that will go from 2000 to present, and it's by county. And what you'll see is that as counties become more blue, that is a growing labor force. And as counties become more red, that is a declining labor force relative to the year 2000. So I'm just gonna let this thing run through, starting with, whoops, where I wanna go. Um, this is the year 2000, 2001, so you can see um, as we move ahead here, as things turn red, that's a shrinking labor force, and as things turn blue, that's an increasing or uh, strengthening labor force. And you can see that the years aren't showing up, oh, they're showing up behind the chat box there, but you can see 2005, the first, the first decade in this uh, millennium, you can see that the it was pretty much flat with a little bit of growth in that Northwest corner and a little bit of decline in the rest of the state. But the recession that started in December of 2007 really amplified these changes. And if you watch what happens as we move ahead here, you can see that both the Southern part of the state and especially the Northeast Kingdom just gets deeper and deeper red as the years pass by. And this only goes to 2018. But you can see by 2018, um, that Northeast corner had lost about 15% of its labor force and the Southern part of the state had lost between five and 15%. Really serious declines. And you might wonder why, well, maybe you don't, you're smart enough to realize the problem with such a, such a shrinking labor force is it's hard to attract business. It's hard to attract the types of things that generate the tax revenue that allow towns to do the things towns want to do when the labor force is getting smaller. If you're trying to convince um, an outside firm to move there, or you're trying to convince local capital to create a startup, it's hard to do when they look into the future and see a declining labor force and, uh, and a declining population to go along with that. And I just screwed that up. Let me get back to where I was, sorry about that. Um, so, but looking at the pandemic itself, uh, we'll start with unemployment insurance claims. And this is probably no surprise to anyone, but this is what the claims data looked like in the first couple months of the, uh, the pandemic. February 29th, when everyone was starting to wonder if perhaps this situation might get bad, uh, you can see that Claims were running probably 4,000. We were running before the pandemic at somewhere on a seasonal basis, somewhere between three and 5,000 claims per month. And then by the middle of April, whoops, by the middle of April, we were looking at uh, continued claims. So people who have 
have been unemployed at least one week and are, and are uh, making a claim of over 70,000, which is about one out of every five people who had a job prior to the pandemic in Vermont. Um, and those numbers remain very elevated as, uh, as time passed. Looking at it by sector here, you can see that, uh, I think you can see my I'm going to assume that's correct. Um, you can see that construction saw a massive increase. Accommodations and food service, there were 11,000 continued claims in food in accommodation and food service alone. And that declined, but it's still well, well uh, above where it had been before the pandemic. It is uh, about 12 times higher than it was before the pandemic started. Um, I'm going to take you to a tableau visualization here for a second. Um, hold on just one second. Where is that? There we go. So uh, if you look at this chart, you can see that this is total non-farm payroll going back to February. And the percents on the side are the percent it has declined or grown, but in this case declined, since February on a monthly basis. You can see we had a slight decline in March, um, about 1.5% decline in March. April, which would be no surprise to anybody, um, about 22% of the, the jobs in Vermont that were here in February were gone by April. And when we look into the future, um, one thing that is both, well, one positive sign is that we've been growing since then. More challenging is the fact that we are still well below where we were and the job growth is tapering off. Um, we, you can just look at the slope of this line and see that over time, we're already starting to see a, slow, a, a slower rate of growth. And that is concerning because we still have a really deep hole to dig out of. If you're wondering, if you look at this by different industries, you can see um, like you know, losing 20, 21% seems bad until you put, uh, where is it? Leisure and hospitality on here. That did not go as planned. What happened? Um, I'm going to try again to put leisure and hospitality on there. Yeah, and you can see leisure and hospitality, which is one of the largest industries in the state, lost 60% of the jobs and is now down by almost half. Um, so certain industries got hit a lot harder than others. And going back to sharing this screen, of the presentation itself. Um, you can see combinations and food services lost 18,500 jobs. Retail trade was down almost 8,000. Uh, the losses were, were very highly concentrated in three or four different industries. Um, you can see in the next one there on a percentage basis, accommodations and food service was the biggest loss, but construction also lost about 26%, um, which is about 4,000 jobs. There's these certain industries saw almost no losses while others were hit very, very hard. And when we look at the recovery effort, it'll be interesting to try to find ways to support these industries that got hit the hardest. Um, looking at the unemployment side of that, take you to this visual. Um, so if you look at the unemployment rate, which is the percentage of people who 
are act, who are either working or actively seeking work who cannot find a job. Uh, that job back in February, we used to look at this number right here back in June 2009 as a really high peak at 6.9%. Um, in the most recent months, we have seen the unemployment rate peak at 16.5%. And those numbers, these unemployment numbers are, uh, have a wide error range on them right now because the models just aren't made for handling this level of change. The model is very good at looking at incremental changes on a month-to-month -month basis. It is not designed to deal with the pandemic, but uh, it appears as if the unemployment rate peaked at about 16.5%, and it's now down to about 8%. But again, the, the rate of decline in the unemployment rate is starting to taper and we seem to be headed towards a, a new equilibrium that is above where we were in the past, which is, is concerning, to put it mildly. And when we look at that, and when we try to look into the future, and economists are not really known for being good at looking into the future, but when we do this, um, let me shift back to this other slide. Uh, when we look in the future as economists, we see a lot of uncertainty, as everyone else does. We remind ourselves that we're not epidemiologists, and those are the people who will really help us navigate our way out of this. But um, when we start to look at places, metrics we might want to use, consumer sentiment is a really important one. Uh, consumer sentiment is one of the primary drivers of growth and of job growth and all that. And... Um, so keeping a close eye on that number, government ordinances and what the government is going to do, both at the state and local level, but also at the federal level. And I think uh, uh, Paul Costello addressed that a little bit, but we are still waiting for some guidance from the federal government. And if that guidance and if that support is going to come. Uh, business failures, as, this, uh, as PPP loans are drying up and as the federal government is choosing not to pass additional stimulus at this point there's some real fail some real concern the business failures are going to spike um, or we'll have a stimulus package that provides support again and then of course the spread of the disease we don't know what the spread of the disease is going to look like in the coming months um, if we can get control of that we could see job growth uh, more sustained job growth of course um, thinking back through some quick final thoughts on all of that before I take any questions you might have. Um, there are just too many unknowns, as we just discussed, about where the economy is headed. What we do know, and what has been clear for decades, is that people who have more formalized and advanced skill sets will always be better off than people who do not have more advanced and formalized skill sets. And that really comes down to education. Um, education and skills still matter and they will continue to matter. If you look at unemployment rates amongst people who have a college degree or people who have post high school education of some form, their rates of unemployment are much lower, their incomes are much higher. Uh, so. All of that still matters. And part of what we're trying to project from L LMI, from my division, is that regardless of what happens in the broader economy, there are certain trends that will continue to be true. And one of those is that skills drive employment um, and encouraging young pe people of all ages, but really young people to advance their education is an important step. Um, we also believe firmly that better information and more information leads to better decisions. And we have a wealth of information on our website there that I'll make sure that this gets shared around afterwards. Um, that's the basics of what I have. And I'm going to stop my screen sharing. Uh, do people have questions? Anything people want to address? Thanks, Kevin. And I'll just, I'll just chime in to say, yeah, we'd love to take some questions or reflections um, from folks in the call. We've got a little bit of time. Um, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just give some guidance really quick and then there's something in the chat I want to run by you, Kevin. But um, for folks that haven't spent a lot of time on Zoom, you can find the raise hand function if you click on participants at the bottom of your screen. 
And within participants, there's a little hand there that you can raise your hand and we can know that, that you'd like to speak. Um, or you can try and unmute and shout as well. Um, so I'm gonna come to, I see Adam's hand, I'll come to Adam in a second. Just really quick, um, a couple questions from the chat. So just to clarify, um, John uh, Mandeville was asking, I, I believe those unemployment numbers do not include self-employed individuals. Is, is that right, Kevin? So, um, the unemployment claims numbers do not include, the early ones do not include self-employed people. The claims numbers don't because that program wasn't up and running at that point. Um, the unemployment rate numbers do include unemployed uh, persons of any stripe because it's a it's a survey that basically asks people if they're employed and if you say no and you say you're actively seeking work you're counted as unemployed in that in that data point um, so okay. claims data uh, claims data and the unemployment rate are two independently generated statistics uh, you can't you can't you can't infer mm -hmm. one thing from the other I see okay. another question. Do we know how many remote workers we have in Vermont and has this increased? Um, we, don't, we don't know that. Uh, is it Darcy? Yeah, Darcy, we, that's not the data that we have at this point. Um, Adam Gernold, you have your hand up. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Hi, for that. that was great, hello. Um, for, for historic context, maybe if you can help uh, explain um, coming out of the Great Recession, we had a uh, number of job losses, uh, and those were in certain industries. Uh, in, in sort of compare and contrast that situation to what we find ourselves now, you spoke about skills and credentials, uh, the high concentration of job losses in this recession or in this situation um, that are tied to hospitality, which traditionally have uh, low barriers to entry for training and skills. And, and how hard it's going to be to replace the sheer number of jobs in comparison to coming out of the recession um, and just what we're up against in, in that. If you have any insights, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, these most recent, well, the most recent layoffs, pandemic generated layoffs, are highly concentrated in a few, in, they're, they're across the board but very highly concentrated in a few industries that we talked about earlier. Um, the Great Recession in 2007, the, the hardest hit industries, construction, finance, uh, leisure and hospitality, took greater losses relative to other industries at that time, but the, the discrepancies weren't so large uh, and nothing can compare we used to talk about the Great Recession as the worst recession since Great Depression, and those numbers suddenly look small across the board relative to what has happened now. Um, and the, the job losses were more broad-based then than they are now. Um, and the concern is that, the, as I said earlier, there was talk, there was hope, I think, of a very v-shaped drop we'd lose all these jobs they'd bounce right back and especially in industries like leisure and hospitality it's just not clear that even if the epidemic was cleared up tomorrow or by the end of the year it's just not obvious how all of these businesses many of which are going to have disappeared by then will be able to bounce back uh quickly it's going to take a lot of time for all those jobs to come back did that address that, Adam? Did yeah, I, just... I guess, and maybe just as a follow-up, um, specific to skills and in, in, in retraining, um, I, you know, it seems to me that we have a, a far greater number of people that we're going to have to retrain uh, than we did coming out of the Great Recession. And these are historically people that have uh, lower education uh, attainment levels than maybe been the case in the Great Recession. And just how do we plan for that? And I don't think it's necessarily an answer you, you can provide today, but just having all of us think about that and the data I think really is, is telling. Yeah, yeah. It's, at this point, we're not even sure where the training needs to be focused, right? Because we don't know which industries are gonna come back strongest out of this. Yeah. Although any amount of education is better than none, so. 
So uh, any other questions that folks have? Um, you can raise your hand or, uh, or go ahead and chime in. Not seeing any. Well, we'll move forward. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. Really appreciate you being here and kind of grounding us in the in the data. Um, it's hard yeah, to move forward I without getting a clear picture. Go, Jenna. Uh, What's just, that? I just want to add one quick thing. If I yeah. quick, um, we have, as I said earlier, we have information at the town level, at the county level, at the labor market area level. If anybody is working on grant proposals or working on anything about your town, if you want information about your town, if you want uh, to chat about what kind of data we might have to support your efforts, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. And I'm sure that Jenna will share my contact information afterwards, but uh, we're always willing and interested in working with towns to uh, get them the information they need. Great, thanks so much. And I, and I will, Kevin, I think what we'll do is gather speaker info, any presentations or or data and um, and I'm actually recording as well. So assuming all goes well with the recording, I'll, I'll share that um, back with the group. Great to see, I, I feel like I know about half of you. It's great to see everyone. I'm gonna sit in for the rest. Awesome, all right, thanks Kevin. Um, all right, well, we're gonna shift to thinking about housing and I'm gonna turn it over to BCBA board member, um, Elise Schombacher, who's also the Addison uh, County Community Trust Executive Director to um, moderate that panel. Elise? Great, thanks. Uh, we're running a, a little ahead, but I think Maura and Joe are both here, so we should be good. Um, I'll just, uh, as Jenna mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of the Addison County Community Trust. We provide affordable housing um, across the county, apartments, mobile homes, and some single family homes. Um, and so I'm really uh, honored to be uh, hosting a housing panel today. I think when the governor told us all to stay home, stay safe, that really brought um, housing issues to the fore. Not all of us had a home in which to stay safe, uh, and many more folks, you know, as we just heard from Kevin, had their livelihoods um, pulled out from under them and didn't know how they were going to make rent or make that mortgage payment. Um, so today we have um, two speakers to help us explore how some of those issues have played out um, and uh, what other issues have come up in the wake of uh, COVID-19. First we have Maura Collins, who's the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, who is going to share her encyclopedic housing knowledge with us at both the statewide and national level. And then we have Joe Kasperzak, uh, the assistant town manager in St. Jay, about how things um, are going up there where the rubber meets the road at the local level. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Maura. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. As Kevin said, so many um, familiar faces, I'm sorry. Um, that we can't be in one room together, but I always appreciate being with other community development minded folks. Um, as Elise said, I'm the director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and have um, been long following um, this organization's work and appreciative of the partnership of VCDA with VHFA. Um, I'm going to jump in with a few thoughts about housing, but definitely um, leave time um, for Joe and for conversation, because I would love to hear from some of you what you're seeing um, when it comes to housing. Um, while I'm supposed to, from this basement bunker office, somehow have my finger on the pulse of housing markets across the state, um, I, I can really only, I'm limited to the data that comes across my screen and listening to the stories of people like you who are very um, uh, well versed in what's going on locally. I'm going to share my screen with a few slides and um, then uh, jump into my comments. Um, I'm assuming you can see my slides now. Uh, so over, I'm just going to throw up a few numbers to ground us and I'll stop showing slides. But over the last 20 years, you can see here that it's almost 20 years. Um, income has gone up in our state just over 2% a year. So to get from just almost 41,000 to 60,000, if you figure out the math, it's just over 2% uh, 2 a year. Whereas uh, rents have gone up 4% a year. 
So rents are going up twice as fast as incomes have been over the last 20 years. And at the same time, the median home price, oops, I missed my home price chart. I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide. Uh, I will show you a line chart that shows that the median price of homes is going up by um, almost 5% a year. So if we imagine every year just losing more and more ground in terms of if our incomes are going up 2% a year, but housing costs are going up more than twice that. And so I'm looking back over the past 20 years, I know we're all focused on what's gonna happen in the next week, in the next few months, in the next year with the pandemic, but we need to remember why, what, we're, what kind of, leave it to a Hauser to say, what foundation we're building this future <laughs> upon and why it's happening. I, I can speak to what's behind the escalating housing costs and it goes back to supply. This chart is showing that in the 1980s, we were increasing our housing supply by almost 2% a year. And so that's it. this is an annualized increase. So while I'm showing a decade at once, that's that every year we were adding 1.8, almost 2% of our housing stock was coming onto the market. And then in the 90s, that dropped to about 1.4%. And in the first decade of the millennium, it was just over a half a percent. And look at where we've been since 2010. It's now a quarter of 1% every year. That's an 86% 80 drop in what we're adding to our housing stock each year. And many counties are actually losing year-round stock. I know I'm giving you the boring Vermont-based numbers and everyone would rather have their community numbers. And I'm going to show you where you can get those. But Many counties are losing year-round housing stock. Bennington, Rutland, Caledonia, Essex, Washington, Wyndham, Windsor, either due to the deterioration of the housing stock, meaning the quality, or to conversion to vacation homes. And now look at my data. It stops in 2018. I'm not taking the pandemic into account and all the articles I'm reading from those of you in Dover and elsewhere where you're seeing so many out of state uh, buyers coming in and, and gobbling up homes. Now, we often hear about if housing's affordable and the, a lot of us use the, the general um, guideline of a home should not cost more than 30% of one's income. And if you're paying more than 30% of your income for your housing, you're not living in affordable housing and you are cost burdened. So you can see in this chart that renters are by far more cost burdened than owners, but so many Vermonters are paying, the, the orange top bar shows how many are paying between 30 and 49% of their income on their housing. That red bar is how many people are paying more than half their income in house, uh, for their housing. Those people are at high risk of eviction, foreclosure, if they have a muffler problem or um, unexpected utility bills, those folks, their budgets are really thin. So almost 30% of homeowners and 50% of renters are cost burdened. Now, people are frustrated. People are, are infuriated by these stats and we see it in articles on comments um, that we read about in the media. Um, whenever there is a wonderful new housing development uh, coming online uh, and something great happens that we should all be proud of, it's not enough and people are angry because they're saying, I, I don't care that Virgin's just got 20 some odd new units. You know, I need it in Fairhaven. And I don't care that there's um, more family housing going up. We need elderly housing. And I, it's not that they don't care. It's just, it's never enough. I, people are insatiable. They, they really are seeing these numbers play out in their personal lives and their communities. And now we have COVID. COVID hit those existing cracks in our system that we've been seeing and have been growing over the last 20 years and they're widening these cracks and people are teetering on the edge and too many people are falling in. Now, 
I do have some hope. I do have a little, little bit of sunshine here, which is that right now the, the state has acted swiftly and quickly in its housing and homeless response since COVID began. We are a, a strong state in being able to say that as far as has been publicly reported, we have not lost one person who's living without a home, one person who's homeless to COVID. The state acted very quickly to move people who are living in congregate, unsafe environments into individualized hotels and motels. And the few people staying in shelters have been able to be distanced enough and safe enough that the state has found other solutions. There's a rental assistance program that the State Housing Authority uh, is running with Federal CARES Act dollars. $25 million is available to uh, renters and to landlords and either party, the renter or the landlord, can apply for this rental assistance through VSHA, the State Housing Authority, and they can get the assistance they need to pay that back rent. VHFA was given $5 million of CARES Act money to stand up a mortgage assistance program where we can pay up to six months of someone's back mortgages, including their property taxes, if they need it, if they've had a COVID um, hardship. And we need help from all of you to help spread the word about those programs. There's other great inspiring housing programs happening right now. Uh, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board is working with um, regional housing providers to convert some apartments and uh, maybe buy up some structures quickly between now and the end of the year and offer those units to people who are homeless so that uh, we can continue to protect the most vulnerable and, and give them permanent housing. To go back to the data, the drop off in housing construction that I showed in one of those charts is exacerbating what we've been seeing since the millennium. It's not just individuals being hurt, it's become so systemic, uh, this, this low level of construction, that it's measurably hurting our economy too. Um, collectively, being an unaffordable state is really impacting our economy. There were um, all three rating agencies, S&P, Fitch, and Moody's, all cite Vermont's limited population and, business, and limited business growth as an economic factor that weighs down the state's ratings. The city of Burlington um, got a, a report saying that the limited affordable housing is putting limits on its strong economy. And they qu a quote from uh, Moody's uh, report to the city of Burlington says, while the city continues to improve policies and grow the affordable housing stock, it remains an ongoing challenge given the demographics. And now we have extra COVID factors that we're watching. We're watching the speed of the market. It specifically, it's looking like a hot seller's market. There's not a lot of data to back that up yet though. You're gonna ask me in the end, what, what can I show you about proving these trends that we all are seeing and hearing about with data and it's too soon. I, I don't have it yet. There is the impact out of staters buying homes. And it, without the data to support this, we're looking at anecdotes and we're gonna need a few more months to be able to see if it shows up in the data. And what will happen this const to construction this winter or fall if there's a resurgence in the virus or if there's a, another slowdown of our construction industry? Housing is a huge economic driver and we need construction to keep moving. And then we have the need for the rental and the mortgage assistance after the pandemic unemployment uh, ends and the economic toil goes on. Those programs, the mortgage and rental assistance programs I spoke of, have been great, but they've been kind of slow to, uh, uh, applications have been slower than we expected. And we think it's because a lot of people have uh, had the benefit of the extra $600 a week. And it's gonna be in the coming months that we see um, this go, the need go higher. So the demographic factors related to COVID that we're watching in the housing world is that if there are more out-of-staters, then we really have the wonderful potential to finally change our racial demographics. Vermont is 95% white, which is not like other states. 
And non-white residents who may be coming into the state are more likely to be young, maybe have larger households, and therefore that's where demographic growth is. They also have very different um, housing outcomes. And we can have a whole nother panel if we wanna talk about why the, the black and African-American homeownership rate is so much lower than the white rate in the state and how it's lower, by the way, than it was before the Civil Rights Act was passed and before Martin Luther King was assassinated, our home ownership rate for black households is now lower than when those things happened in the late 60s. So the demographic factors are that if we see more people coming in from out of state, it could really change and shift our housing markets and the demographics. And we need to make sure that Vermont is welcoming in all ways, including affordability. And that's how we can have some control over changing this changing demographic future in our state. So if we had, I would posit that if we had a adequate affordable housing and in migration created by the availability of affordable housing, it would be a credit positive for the state it would be a boon for our downtowns and village centers, uh, and it would really support the fabric of Vermont by having more people living safely and affordably here. So how do we do this? Well, we have to look at every aspect of our communities to ensure that we're welcoming and engaging of all residents. Um, I'm going to get off my housing soapbox. Usually I, I see people who know me know that I see everything through a housing lens and that's all I really um, am authorized to speak about. But um, working with Paul on the governor's task force over the last several months have, has allowed me to work with others, including Josh Hanford I see on the call and, and maybe there are others. I didn't scroll through all 50 people yet. But um, that that the task force, we worked on, on a resource source tool called the Municipal Engagement Tool. And Jenna has the link um, that I'm sure can be shared. And this is a tool that all communities can um, walk through. And frankly, it's a little bit in order of easiest to hardest um, about how to do some, some self checks to make sure that your community is being as welcoming and engaging of historically marginalized populations as possible. And there's examples, there's links to communities in Vermont who have done the things that we're proposing that your community consider. So it's very accessible in that way and possible. We're not saying, you know, wave your magic wand and end racism. We're saying, look at the demographics of the people who serve on your commissions and, and uh, planning bodies and ask them to self-identify some of their demographics and see what kind of results you get back and see if maybe there's a little more you want to do to um, uh, change up uh, the, who you're, you're hearing from most often and if you're really serving the people that you believe you're serving. But it's going to take all hands on deck. It's not just up to these municipal planning boards. There's also a need for more federal funding for affordable housing. And I promise you, lots of us are working and advocating loudly for that. We need more state funding for affordable housing because of the feds, you know, we know about devolution and the feds as they walk away from their funding commitments, the state has rightfully stepped up and tried to fill that goal. We, we've heard about the $37 million housing bond that VHFA issued several years ago, and uh, there's more that needs to be done at the state level. But we also need you. We need local funding or at least housing ready planning and zoning for housing. So um, what I will end with asking of all of you is if you would consider looking at the potential of creating a housing commission in your community. And we have resources that can help you. This is sort of our new uh, charge for the future. I make inappropriate jokes about how communities often have cemetery commissions and not housing commissions. And I think that says a lot about our values of uh, what we think about people who've passed versus the current residents. And I think that it's worth 
not only the people living in our communities today, but the people who want to live in our communities, who we are all desperate to bring into our core village centers, we owe it to them um, to make sure that we're offering opportunities for them to uh, have affordable place to live. So the last thing I'm gonna show you are some resources um, that VHFA has created this housing ready toolbox. And um, at that ugly link at the top, I'm gonna share this in the chat when I finish yapping at you. Um, you can see uh, if you went to this link, housingdata.org and these steps for municipalities, you would find all these links where we walk people through fair housing. But you can see here, we also talk about why start a housing committee. We give you who should be on the membership. We explain and give you links to all the existing ones in Vermont that we know about. We give you the outreach tools. So there's a sample charter and charge and um, how to, I just, last week, Essex um, Junction and the town just started up its housing committee. It took two years of me and others going to the um, planning bodies to get it done, but we got it done. And so we've put all these tools online as well as housing needs data, how to do housing needs assessments, and then all the great regulatory tools that hopefully you know about, like the Zoning for Great Neighborhoods guide that just came out and other things so that communities can be housing ready for the changing demographics that we um, hope and hopefully expect can happen in the future. So I will stop there and pass it off to the next. Thank you. Unless you want me to do questions now, are we gonna do questions after Elise? Uh, yeah, let's uh, shift over to Joe for a little while and then we'll leave some time for questions. Thank you. Great. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Kasperzak. I'm the assistant town manager from the town of St. Johnsbury. And I also chair the local housing committee. And I post minutes for our really strong cemetery commission on our website. So um, the comments I hear uh, thus far are really pretty powerful. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to, on behalf of the town of St. Johnsbury, uh, talk with you and on behalf of our housing committee and uh, give a plug to Vermont Council of Rural Development who came to St. Johnsbury in 2015 for a community visit process that ended with, you know, five really strong committees and an action plan that we continue to use today. Um, I'd also comment that it was great timing that that visit came just before we engaged on our new rewrite of our town plan. So it was uh, really important. And we look to those two documents on a weekly and monthly basis in just about everything we do. And that's really important uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but in particular, it can guide you through in a longer term strategic planning um, vision where the whims of short-term politics in small communities can kind of take you off the beaten path. So we're very proud uh, to have those documents. Um, so uh, a quick little snippet of what we've done in St. Johnsbury. Um, I'm gonna just go down, I'll come back to some of these particular points. And then I'm gonna talk about a program uh, that we just started this winter, which we refer to as a rental housing improvement program. Uh, 2015, uh, as I mentioned, we had a community visit um, and I started working for the town of St. Johnsbury. Uh, and of course, it didn't take long to notice. And I should mention that I grew up in St. Johnsbury too. So not only do I have a pretty good knowledge of the town, but I'm pretty passionate about it. You could see very easily that the quality of our housing stock was deteriorating. Um, you know, we were dealing with property owners uh, that were not investing in their properties. And then we saw that if we didn't address that uh, quickly, we were gonna be in a situation where investment wasn't, didn't make any sense. And um, so we were very strategic and deliberate about how we we're gonna try to develop a plan to move forward. And you know, we realized that there was great state and county information, but we didn't have 
housing specific information for the town of St. Johnsbury. So uh, we hired a consultant to perform a housing study and needs assessment. And it really gave us the backbone uh, for grant funding and for um, future work regarding housing. We went through the long process of developing a code compliance program that included a proactive rental housing inspection program and a rental housing registration program. And I dare say that was about a three and a half year process. Uh, it was a lot of work. It took a lot of commitment from uh, all of our local agencies, stakeholders, residents. Uh, we reached out to a number of other communities who were just wonderful uh, to share their experiences in similar type programming and in fact would even come over and meet with our select board and help us embark on this, this new um, program. Through the whole process, one of the strategies we did though was we made sure to over communicate and with all cohorts in the housing world and reached out to um, you know some of our toughest landlords right up front, invited them into the office and told them our thoughts and our plans. And it wasn't received all that well, but they respected the fact that they were part of the dialogue right from the very beginning. Um, we also hosted quarterly landlord information exchanges. And that was, that was facilitated uh, through both the town and the housing committee. And then later uh, through the restorative justice center as a partner. We continue to have those dialogues with our landlords and try to hear all sides of the equation for housing in St. Johnsbury. Um, and so I mentioned that, that code compliance and the registration piece. Uh, one of our partners in Rural Edge at the time suggested that maybe some kind of carrot would help as you embark on a fee structure and it looked rather penal and it looked like government uh, you know, bearing its power and influence. And so we looked to develop some kind of programming that would help fund something that would support property owners, property managers. And we met with VAOA, we met with different organizations trying to figure out what that program would be. Um, and so through many meetings and probably about a year and a half with the housing committee, uh, we developed really three programs, um, two of which are ready once funded uh, to be implemented, one being a home buyer assistance program, another being uh, an intern program that included housing to help support some of our local uh, businesses. And then we developed this rental housing grant improvement program. And really, uh, that's basically a one-to-one uh, -one match with a 3,000 maximum grant through the town uh, for improvements to rental housing units that uh, meet universal design guidelines. And uh, we went back and forth on, you know, whether it was handicap targeted um, and what we could use as a universal guide that people would have access to. And that's what we chose, universal guide. We thought that by providing uh, that document, it would um, give the guidance that we needed and it would open up the properties to uh, a greater uh, group of people and renters. So through our although I, I would recommend not to uh, roll these out during a pandemic, it's been extremely challenging. Um, not only is it difficult to communicate, uh, it's difficult uh, to convince people to invest in their properties, uh, at least at the beginning of this uh, program. And um, we had, in our first round, we had five applicants and we funded three, the type of, um, projects that we're funding in the first round and in fact in the second round typically were um, no slip flooring, improved lighting, 
grab bars in bathrooms, um, windows, improved windows, uh, keyless entry, things of that nature. Um, and the things we learned and the things we didn't think about as we embarked on this program were things like, what if the house was for sale? Uh, how can the town fund that? Um, what happens when somebody wants to meet universal guidelines with personal property like front load washing machines and things like that? And how does that work and how does the town fund that? And I should probably mention how we funded the program um, and why we funded it the way we did. We funded it through a percentage of the registration fees for the housing registry. And we funded it actually with some economic development reserves that I requested of our select board. And um, we did that so that we didn't have any restrictions because all of the landlords were paying into this pool of money and we wanted to make sure to not exclude and make it available for everyone. I should also mention that this is probably the first time that I know of that St. Johnsbury has really uh, invested uh in itself at least in an above ground partnership with people who are in for-profit businesses and it's a it's a new um kind of thought process for us i often uh joke with a town manager who's an engineer civil engineer by trade he says he can bond a hundred million dollars worth of underground infrastructure without a question but the hundred thousand, hundred million dollars, sorry, that we need in above ground improvements to make our community work is a whole nother beast. And it's very difficult. And it includes people who are for profit. And so it becomes a lot of public private type discussions. And so I think what we're seeing in St. Johnsbury is a trend um, for the town to take a lead in revitalization and economic development and investment in its community, which I believe is necessary. We don't think that building the infrastructure in water sewer is enough to attract businesses. We have to plant the seed to help try to grow and stimulate investment in our downtown. Um, and that rings true with some of the other projects that we have going right now as we look to uh, invest in public safety buildings and, it, and also invest and research possibilities of regionalization of things like fire services. I mention these things because they're, everything seems to be connected. Um, we want to attract remote workers, we want to attract workforce for our companies, uh, our manufacturing um, businesses, and we struggle with the quality of housing that is required. And um, while I hear a lot about the affordable housing piece, um, I also carry the torch for the market rate. I'd be interested to hear from other communities and, and other folks uh, on this panel or in this conference whether you face the similar things that we do in St. Johnsbury where your market rate housing is the same rate and quality as your affordable housing in your community. And that's what we're struggling with. Um, we struggle to attract nurses and doctors, uh, engineers, and all of those people. We see uh, professionals going to the ski areas and renting condominiums that take beds away from the ski areas uh, in times when they need to put skiers on the slopes because that's the best stock. We see successful seniors who rent condominiums at the ski area because that's the best quality housing that they can find for the needs that they have. Um, and so we figure things are a bit out of balance and we'd love to try to find a way to attract development. But uh, I think I've heard about the cost of construction being a big hurdle there as we look to try to build out housing and solve some of our issues. Um, I've met recently with some folks down south who are uh, developers and they say you know, the, the only 
successful development they've seen in the state of Vermont for the last 10 years has been affordable housing and public safety and public service projects. And somehow we're gonna to have to address uh, the construction costs and how we're going to attract private investment to the communities as well. So uh, I think what I've learned uh, is that, as Paul mentioned, nobody's gonna come save us. We're the ones who are need to solve our own problems. We need to invest in our communities. Um, I know in St. Johnsbury, I'm sure many of the, in probably all the communities in Vermont, there's passionate people who really care about their communities and are willing to step up. Uh, the trick is finding where that cross section of passion and energy is and how to turn it into action. Uh, we've been fortunate with a couple of our housing initiatives that we've been able to turn them into action. It's not easy. Um, and we're also very pleased to see that our town government is actually taking a lead uh, and working with local agencies and development partnerships uh, to grow St. Johnsbury. Thanks, Joe. Um, that was really interesting. We have about five minutes uh, and there have been some questions coming in for the chat. Um, so while Joe takes a, a break and refreshes himself with a sip of water, I'm actually going to shift back to uh, Maura, this question from Darren, um, who echoes Paul's support of the message to promote social and racial diversity um, through immigration. Can you give more specifics of what our housing stock slash future needs could be with that changing demographic? Yeah, it's really easy. Um, everyone wants the same thing, which is affordable housing. So everyone defines affordable housing differently. Each of us on this call um, would have a different number that's affordable to us. I have three very young kids uh, and I know Elise does as well now. I mean, when you have childcare in the mix, when you have maybe high health expenses, if you have student loan debt, then in a home affordability gets calculated very differently. So the more that we can um, drive down the cost of housing so that it is available and accessible to the most number of people. That is um, what we can do to try to be attractive in our communities and as a state um, to folks who may be moving here from out of state. Uh, the good news is, is that um, the diversity that exists outside Vermont and even within Vermont, you know, as far as I know, people of color are not looking for different types of homes than white folks are. It's all housing. They want shelter. They want to be able to afford it. They want the survey show. They want it to be um, in connected communities where they things are walkable and um, that if there is a drive that they are not far from um, uh, major uh, institutions, health care and others. Um, but really, it, it just comes down to we just need to have the housing that is appealing to that would be appealing to any of us. And while I, I hammer home the affordability question, I also think that that goes to the question of um, the quality of housing. And uh, that in a lot of parts of our state, we don't, when I want to be very clear, when I say we need more affordable housing, I don't mean that we need to stand up new structures. And most of our counties, especially when I was listing all those counties that were losing housing stock, I don't know that the answer is to create more housing stock, but it's to bring the existing housing stock that we have up to a better quality so that it's more marketable and appealing to younger folks. We know that people of color skew much younger and so they will be looking for modest or good quality housing and that is not how I would characterize the housing in um, across the state in a lot of our more rural areas. So those are a few of my thoughts. And I'll just add anecdotally, you know, since you mentioned that I have a little one at home too, um, the our success with the housing piece is obviously going to be tied to our success with all of these other pieces, um, in particular with childcare, with the reduction in hours in childcare being provided because of COVID. Uh, my parents are in fact ones who have snapped up a condo here in Virgins, one of the new, um, very few new uh, homes that is even on the market in our area. Um, and that's to help backstop childcare issues. So, you know, our success with childcare and schools is going to support our success in housing in these other areas. 
Um, shifting back to Joe, uh, Patricia is asking if you can tell us more about the partnership that CJ has with Rural Edge for homeless single parents. So one thing I think that uh, has been really interesting and being the chair of the housing committee, which is uh, from the, from, from the uh, Vermont Rural uh, Community Development Program community visit is it's tied the town with some of the agencies and it within our community. And, you know, I think there's been a divide from a number of years. Um, and I think this has been really healthy. So we support uh, Rural Edge. We work with them and consider them a partner. Uh, I probably meet with Patrick on a weekly basis uh, to discuss different opportunities. Um, and we support, you know, their uh, administration of the new rehab program through the stimulus program. Um, and so, Trish, I don't know specifically exactly what you were referring to, I mean, or what your question was. Do you have that in the chat? Yeah, I was just, you know, um, it seems to be a unique um, program project partnership with the municipality looking at housing. I don't know if it's anywhere else in the state. So I just thought, you know, a minute of what you, you know, how that partnership is working for um, homeless single parents is my understanding, who will also be, you know, in the workforce. So, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting when we talk with Rural Edge, we bend each other, them, uh, maybe towards maybe market rate thoughts, inclusive in, you know, a mixed use project. And then the town also uh, more leverage towards addressing homelessness, which typically uh, I think has been the job and role of the agencies in our community. Um, we like to think that we are at the table in all the discussions with housing, including you know the COCs, uh, the NEK Prosper, all of those pieces. And we understand that our community and our residents need uh, town government to support those programs and those initiatives. Great. Thanks. Well, it's 2.32, so I'm going to leave it there. I will say we have a mixed income um, development in Virgins opening up and happy to continue that conversation when we break out. Um, but for now, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Jenna to kick off the business panel. Great. Thanks, Elise and Joe and Maura. Really appreciate having you all on the call. Um, yeah, we're going to move on to, to start to think about the future of Vermont's businesses and downtowns. Um, and to moderate that uh, discussion, I'm going to hand it over to Chip Sawyer, um, the Director of Planning and Development in the City of St. Albans. Thanks, Jenna. We have two great panelists for this conversation. Uh, Matt Barong of Virgins represents the Addison 3 District in Montpelier. And Representative Barong gradu graduated from NECI with a degree in culinary arts. Over his 20 year career, he's worked in fine dining establishments in Manhattan, Boston, and Burlington. And since 2007, he's been the chef and owner of Three Squares Cafe, which is a casual eatery in downtown Virgins. And we're also joined by Trip Muldrow. He's one of the principal uh, the principals at Arn Muldrow. And that's a planning firm that's assisted many communities in Vermont over the past 15 years, especially with downtowns. Trip's an accomplished urban planner with over 20 years experience in a broad range of areas in the planning profession and his focus has been linking planning and urban design projects with successful economic development and community revitalization strategies in small and medium-sized communities. And Tripp helped a lot with, uh, you know, leading to what became a huge revitalization in, in the city of St. Albans as well. Uh, so, you know, a lot of thanks to these two gentlemen for joining us today. Matt's juggling, uh, running his restaurant with also the busy uh, re resumption of the session in Montpelier and, and trips, I'm sure um, this firm's hearing from a lot of downtowns and other communities as they try to uh, respond to COVID. I think, you know, what I'm hoping we can hear a lot about right now is, um, 
you know, what do they, what do we think the future is going to look like? What should we be planning for? We've heard a lot about the effects of COVID on people, on housing, on employment, and on businesses. Well, what do you think the is going to be the the next step in evolution for our small businesses from this? And um, how do we think consumer behavior and retail and dining will be transformed? Um, so what are you seeing right now? And what do you think that might be a clue for what we'll see into the future post COVID in the new normal? Um, let's start with Trip and then, and then Representative Burong to follow up in you know, about uh, 15 minutes or so and then leave some time for questions. So Trip, if you can, why don't you kick us off? Great, thank you so much, Chip. Um, <clears throat> it is such a thrill to see all of you um, and being from South Carolina and being in South Carolina, I just wanna pause and say, just take one second and say, thank goodness I live in the Green Mountain State because in the outside world, anything you're dealing with, it's sheer, utter hell here. Uh, <clears throat> where we have divisive uh, politics, mask wearers and non-mask wearers confronting each other in the grocery store, it's just, um, you know, people partying and gathering in groups in Myrtle Beach and then sending it off to other places. Thank goodness I live five hours away from Myrtle Beach. Um, it's, it's great to see so many faces from across the state. I want to talk about a few things that we're seeing that are trending now and where we see these heading. Um, first, McKinsey does kind of an update report on consumer behavior and they release it fairly regularly and there are five things that they're seeing and I'll talk about these and how they're going to impact short term and long term. Uh, the first one is discretionary spending is recovering now um, and so for a while we were in a hunker down mode getting necessities and sort of crisis shopping um, and consuming goods in a crisis manner. Um, discretionary spending across the country is starting to loosen as restrictions loosen. And I think barring a, you know, a calamity with, you know, the pandemic and, and the virus, you know, reintroducing itself, hopefully we'll see that continue. Health and safety and care are kind of the focal point. And I don't believe we're gonna see that disappearing. And um, I'll use one example, I'm actually working in the state of Alabama, uh, where they are working with 50 communities across the state, installing foot plates for small independent businesses, plexiglass, spacing stickers, all the things that really need to prepare businesses to reopen. And they're doing it alongside training for the businesses so that it's kind of like you get this in exchange for going to the, these trainings. But the trainings are really important because I'll talk about another trend in a minute. Um, people are still holding out on out-of-home activity, but that's starting to decline. 73% um, of households were saying they weren't going out of home to do things. At the beginning of August, that's declined to 68% as of the McKinsey report. And I'll post a link in the uh, chat. Um, uh, that, that, that just came out two days ago. The, the key thing that we're seeing is this whole idea of this digital move for consumers. And I think it's really important, particularly in Vermont, um, when we talk about digital, there are three trends that are kind of intertwined. One is the move to digital. The one is the move to what we call omni-channel. And I had to really kind of get deeper into this from you know, we used to shop single channel, I'd walk into the store. And then we went to multi-channel where I would shop in the store, but there was a website. Well, now we're really looking at that omni-channel experience where I want to be able to access the food or the shop or the restaurant and do that in a seamless way. And I, I know that you all, if any of you are doing what I'm doing, you know, when you order out, I mean, in a bigger city like I live in, I can get Grubhub or things like that, but it's super clunky to try and order from a restaurant in a small town um, because you're picking up the phone or you're taking the order, there's just no clear way to do that. And so that shift is gonna be really important for small businesses as we move ahead. 
Um, so I, I, some of the things I feel like are gonna be critical that we look at moving ahead is digital access to businesses and ease of use. Because the other part that's happening with consumers is what's called shock to loyalty, where people are giving up on um, certain traditional things where they were shopping and they're going to new things and that shock to loyalty, they're sticking with it. So for example, I found a couple of, you know, independent local restaurants where it's like, okay, that's my go-to. I know I can get this. I know what my experience is going to be. I'm going to stick with that. And so that presents an opportunity and especially in, in, in Vermont where Vermont has curated a culture of local shopping for the years. Um, and so we, we certainly see this whole idea of local shopping and comfort with local shopping. That's going to be a trend that's going to stick with us for quite some time. Um, the other piece is this whole idea of buying local. And the Buy Local Vermont program is getting ready to launch. Uh, ACCD, I know, has been working on that. And, and that is going to be a critical piece of this. I will say a concern as I hear the data is the in Vermont, your, your accommodations and tourism industry, you know, that's going to be a real challenge. And one of the things that I've, you know, I've traveled your beautiful state from one end to the other. Um, what I'm finding is that I'm very comfortable doing travel within like my local area where I know what to expect uh, and what to do. And I think that's going to be something that we see. Another really important piece is something that the state's been working on for a long time, all the partners have been working on, is this idea of placemaking and creating flexible spaces for people to gather that are, make them feel comfortable and safe. Um, and so whether that is working with VTrans on letting people into the right of way, which is something that we're actually just working on with the town of Fairleigh, Vermont, on, um, to creating gathering spaces where people can social distance. Um, and so there are some uh, proposals that are on the table for enhancing um, placemaking uh, in Vermont. And it's before the legislature and it's before the governor. And that's one of the things I really love about working in Vermont is, and I think this is important as I wrap up, um, is, and hand it over to an elected official, is um, <laughs> in the, in the other states of the union, the spirit of cooperation in, in Vermont among the governor, the legislature, the agencies, the private sector, the public sector, allies, excels in Vermont. When I contrast that with the state of Washington where I'm working with their Main Street program, Governor Inslee, as he deals with the allocation of the CARES Act funding, that's going through the Department of Commerce, Main Street is housed over at the Archives and History Department. They do not talk to one another, so that funding has to go all the way down and then back up again uh, to reach the appropriate people. They're not allowed to talk to each other one-on-one. -on -one. That's not how things work in your state. Y'all can go across the hall and have conversations. And, and that's a positive takeaway that I want to leave you with is that your state is a state that, can, that was already readying itself for this pandemic. And the Main Street program, downtowns, and all the incentives that are being proposed and have been in existence in Vermont for years really position you to be more resilient than many other states because you're not mired down in the bureaucratic nightmare that we see in other states where we work. And I'll close by just saying that a lot of where my talking is right now is we have got to shift our mindset from crisis management to recovery. Um, you know, after Irene, um, this, this calamity that we're in, um, if we maintain crisis mode, our mental health and our community's mental health are gonna suffer until we move to solutions and recovery. And what I see in the proposals like the bilo Vermont and the Better Places proposals, those are solutions. And so that's why I want to be leave you with some positivity here because there is a, if you are in South Carolina, 
if you're in Washington State, if you're in Mississippi, you know, it's a mess. And, and so keep that spirit going amongst you all. And uh, with that, I'll kind of wrap it up and hand it over. Um, thank you, Chip. Thanks a lot, Tripp. Now, what, what insight do you have, Representative Barron? No, thanks, Tripp. Um, I'm actually really encouraged to see that um, Tripp and I um, really have our heads in the same places um, with a lot of these, these perspectives and the direction that we see the, the recovery and, and business evolution at this point. Um, so mostly like putting my head around what the recovery is gonna look like. I've been asked this conversation for a month now in and out of meetings like this, um, daily if not weekly. Um, the thing I've been telling people over and over is to just make sure that they understand that as we move forward with this, it is gonna be slow. It is gonna be very uncertain because there's so much movement within how the pandemic is impacting our tourism sector, uh, everything from that to supply chain to what we needed to do at the beginning with the shutdowns then slowly turning things on sector by sector. So that uncertainty I think is still gonna to continue to exist, especially as we uh, go into the unknown of a um, fall and winter season. And within that, Everybody has to understand and realize that they have to remain as nimble as possible, right? The people who are uh, capable of adapting and um, maneuvering their business model quickly and aptly will be the ones who um, uh, survive and maintain a, a higher degree of resiliency through all of this. Now, we've had wonderful economic assistance and support structure from the state of Vermont, I, I think across the board, now also echoing that point that it has been um, managed very well from top to bottom, um, especially given conversations I've had with colleagues in both government and the hospitality sector across the country. Um, other states are, their, their businesses, retail, hospitality, especially those I've been in contact with, are certainly not faring as well as ours. Um, so I want to applaud that, but also make sure everyone understands that we need to continue with that effort and conversations I've had with the congressional delegation, they of course understand that and have their heads in the same place. Um, you know, one of the keys for everyone right now though is also, I think for a recognition that there may be a need for continued subsidies and supports to the businesses, um, especially within hospitality when you're dealing with the loss of outdoor dining is just around the corner for, for the sector. That has been really the lifeblood um, of this, this interim bounce back that everyone's seen. Um, you talk to any owner operator at this point, uh, ask them how things are going. They will tell you almost certainly things are down, but they're doing okay. They've adjusted staffing. They've adjusted purchasing. They've gone to online ordering models, maybe added delivery mechanisms, all of those things that have been discussed. But once we lose that outdoor seating as an industry, it's really going to change the numbers game. So, you know, the, the, the cash on hand, whether it be the grant programs or maybe a nest egg that they've been able to shore up with, you know, wise use of programs like PPP, et cetera, that, that really has a high potential of running out quickly. And then we have to ask ourselves as, as government supporting agencies, what's the smarter play here? Do we invest a little bit more money in helping them maintain their business or see a high level of attrition within these sectors, and then it'll cost a lot more money down the road, not only supporting their employees as they're on assistance, and also what are we gonna have to put into in downtown economic development programs to refill these empty storefronts with people who are less experienced with operating. Because those operators who went out and didn't go out because they didn't know their industry, they went out because of pandemic. You know, I mean, there's no three ring binder on this thing. We're all writing it as we go. Um, labor market is an interesting thing right now. Uh, as people are coming back, um, you know, the, the business operators are, fortunately from what I've seen, been able to bring back their key employees pretty quickly. They've been very enthusiastic to come back to work. Everybody's adjusting in a positive way to the new protocols and systems, contact tracing, et cetera. I've seen no real problems with that. Um, the biggest problem that I see with the workforce, and I've seen it for years, is the lack of affordable housing for the workforce itself. Many of the individuals 
um, even when they're at that like 14, 15, $17 an hour rate, really struggle to find housing um, that they find to be suitable for the price they're paying. And also in a, a convenient distance commuter time to and from their employer. Um, and that's something that's always been a, 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 even before I was elected, something I've really had long, hard conversations with people about at my local and statewide level. Um, I think that still may, needs to be a, a primary focus of all of our efforts. Um, and now with behavior and trends, you know, not to just keep reiterating, but of course the online platforms and delivery services. Um, and one thing I've been reading lately and have noticed that those have really been um, being sourced and utilized by two distinct demographics, millennials and people of higher income brackets who have disposable income. So I've had conversations with people at the industry about how you kind of like continue to target those demographics to focus your online ordering platforms um, as a target audience. You know, there's a lot of ability within social media, especially to target very, very finite demographics. So I also encourage people to maybe utilize those resources to maximize their, their advertising dollars. Um, again, another thing which is a trend that's kind of been in the pipeline for a while, and I think has been exacerbated by this, is um, operating with less staff. You have less capacity. People have shifted to, especially in restaurants, shifted to uh, more takeout volume, less dining room capacity, and a shift to disposables. So many, many restaurants and eateries have done away with dishwashers, uh, less prep cooks, things of that nature. So they're running a little leaner and meaner. Um, and that's just something I've, I've really noticed is uh, not only streamlining how they're, they're operating their, their interior operations, but they're also streamlining reduced menu items, you know, less food on hand. Um, because again, it's, it's a lot of uncertainty, not only with your customer base, but also with supply chain. There's been huge supply chain issues. Um, and I think that is something that could actually fare well for Vermont. Um, back to the, the localized food systems that we've spent the last 20 years developing. Um, the, the feeder system that we've established, um, people have started eyeing that for more direct sourcing for the businesses because we're actually more confident what we can get locally just because of what we saw out of the, the meatpacking facilities, et cetera. Um, and the, the, fluctua the fluctuation of prices of those commodity meats, especially when they hit a spike, there's less, there's less peak and valley with the localized meat system. And so to, to maintain your uh, food cost, you can, you can set it slightly higher or a slightly higher price point with a local product and maintain consistency. And I've been seeing a lot of people actually going in that direction as opposed to playing with the fluctuation of the national supply chain. So that was something I, I wanted to hit on. Um, now, with businesses, unfortunately, are, are going out of business. Some you know, will not make it through the winter. Uh, for those that have the ability to hold on and, and be resilient through all this, um, it is a unique opportunity to like fortify your brand in your local economy, um, to really entrench yourself. Um, it's something I've seen happen with businesses uh, with the big recession in 08. Um, you know, say two or three of your competing or neighboring restaurants doesn't survive you do see sort of a consolidation of the money start coming through that business. And it's an opportunity if you execute your model correctly um, to really anchor yourself in for a, a positive position in your marketplace moving forward out of the recovery. Um, and I saw a lot of those businesses become very um, kind of like flagship community leader businesses with how they engage with the community too. I mean, sort of back to that camaraderie community spirit that a lot of our, our independent operators have. Um, in 08, I've seen it now, many of those businesses have really stepped up to the plate with community engagement, not just as the business, but as a forwarding face, uh, forward face, of, uh, of their localized economy. So I think that's also something very positive that we have. And as 
agencies and officials should really help promote and, and encourage as we have these conversations. Now, lasting impacts, of course, you know, it's like, how long are we going to deal with um, capacity restrictions? How long are we going to deal with contact tracing? These are kind of unknowns. But again, everybody's stayed acclimated to it well. Um, one of the big question marks is also what is what is going to happen with special events, right? I mean, we have a massive, um, you know, brewers festivals, food festivals, wedding industry, um, things of that nature. What is that going to look like moving forward? Um, and that is one of the biggest economic question marks I've been having with a lot of people lately. Uh, most of the business from this year has been rescheduled for next year. People are taking on more parties, contracts, weddings, what have you, for next year. I've talked to a lot of operators of uh, event venues, places like Basin Harbor, and then smaller independent outfits um, that are already booked for the biggest years they've ever had for next year. So everybody's hoping we can execute these events, but again, it's back to that nimbleness, right? Like, are you gonna be able to do a, uh, an event for 250 people, or how are you gonna shift through that? Um, you know, for the sake of time, for everybody to have a comfortable conversation moving forward, I'll wrap it up with that. Um, but those are a lot of the, uh, the uh, impacts I've seen, maneuvering and adjusting I've witnessed and also impl uh, implemented at my business. So uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thanks to both of you. Um, just looking at the chat real quick, uh, we have... Um, we have a question from Elise um, about business consolidation. And, and one side effect of this is downtown's trying to fill vacant commercial spaces. Maybe Trip can speak to what kinds of businesses downtown should be looking to recruit for these vacant spaces in terms of what industries are emerging and the, what's going to be able to sustain a physical experience after the crisis. That's a really good question. That's one that we're grappling with all over. Um, I, th I think what we're going to see is one of the things to keep in mind is the nature of the space as much as the type of business. And so what we're seeing more and more of is smaller spaces that allow entrepreneurs to have a lower barrier to entry. So the example would be I'm working in a very small town in Washington state where um, there was an owner of a local hardware store. The hardware store was unsustainable. He closed it. He now has 15 vendors within it. And several of those vendors have graduated out because their online presence and their success was so good that they didn't need to be in that space. And so I think that's going to be something to look at is, and what we're going to see in Vermont, when I look at your, one of your key data points is that you all, uh, the, the state consistently leaks sales on things like clothing and, and kind of basic goods, particularly along the Connecticut River line, where you can kind of lop off over to New Hampshire and, and get some of those big box. I see that as some of the opportunity as well. And then we're, we're seeing a lot of niche, just highly customer oriented businesses. And the final thing I'll say is we're going to see a lot more of the growing trend that we had me seen Vermont was leading it of this combination of not just restaurant but food that you can pick up and take home this idea and there were we were seeing restaurants do this all over the country where they didn't they couldn't seat people but you could st take stuff and prep it at home um, or they were using their supply chain access because they had they had access to the meat you know <laughs> the butcher and they were selling the steaks for you to take at home. Um, and so again, some of those I think we're gonna see is the, like the specialized food grow. I'll throw something else in there real quick that kind of slides into this. Um, one thing I've discussed with some people and have had feedback on is the ability if, uh, especially if somebody has an option on a lease coming up or something of that nature, there is an ability right now to uh, renegotiate more favorable leases for the vendors or for, for the business themselves. Uh, whether it's a more amenable price per square foot or say you have a, you know, you just did a, for example, a five year and you have a five year option that's on the business. Um, you don't feel comfortable with that. I do know people who have worked out a year to year because of the market uncertainties. So um, as property owners, property management companies are seeing more spaces be less viable 
And if you are a viable operation, they are going to be very user friendly when it comes to the terms of your, uh, your space. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. One in the chat that actually I skipped by mistake, but this one comes from Elijah and uh, starting with Representative Barong, you noted that online platforms and delivery systems have been particularly useful for businesses right now, especially accessing millennials and those with disposable income. Um, between, between the two of you, are there any other tools you're aware of that businesses should be focusing on to build their capacities in? And that's a good question. We all talk a lot about delivery and online delivery and online, but is there more we should be looking at in terms of what businesses, the tools that they should be using to access uh, and make connections with customers right now? I, one thing I've been, uh, I recently started promoting just to speak to ourselves internally at Three Squares, is um, our um, our city, Virgin's put out a lot of um, extra picnic tables in our park with the, you know, good distancing in between them. And since we only have a limited amount of indoor seating, you know, a patio that has limited capacity, we've been actually driving a lot of customers over there. And it's a way that also like really cross promotes the town in a nice way. So if you can work with a municipality, I mean, I know we're running tight on, you know, weather time here, but, um, you know, if we're looking forward to things in the springtime and next year, um, how do businesses work with the municipalities, downtown or village center partnerships in trying to uh, cross utilize the, uh, the green spaces in town that also help promote these, you know, walkable downtowns and livable communities. I think that's something to put a footnote on. Sure. What about any thoughts, Trip? Yeah, I, I definitely concur with um, uh, Representative Barong on that. And, and, and just an idea, and, and I'm going to throw it on the table, is, you know, and I think about, you know, this work I'm doing recently in Fairleigh, Vermont, um, where, you know, there's a big town hall that's hardly used. That space, you know, when it's not being occupied for meetings, when the weather gets cold, you could have socially distanced dining within that space. And so that creativity in warm weather of creative placemaking, I think really can extend to cooler weather, cold weather uh, for me, um, you know, in the winter time. The other piece that I would mention is a lot of small towns that we're working in that don't have the grub hubs or the whatevers, they, I've actually seen businesses take individuals take over and they're doing the food delivery for the restaurants as an entrepreneur. Um, and so I'm working in several small towns where it's like, you don't call Grubhub, you call Billy, you know, and he's going to get in his car and go pick it up and bring it to you. And so that ends up being um, an opportunity for a new business uh, to fill a gap that the, all the restaurants together, you know, don't have to create delivery staff to do it. Thanks to both of you. I'm going to hand it back off to Jenna, and uh, I think we can continue a lot of these conversations in our breakout groups. All right. Well, thank you, Chip, and, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a half, well, we've got 25 minutes here to break out into some sessions to do a little workshopping together. Um, I always get nervous about breakouts on Zoom, but we're going to do it, and hopefully it's going to work. <laughs> it's going to be seamless. Um, but basically, I've got it set up so that we're going to break out into even groups of about eight to 10 people. And uh, each of the breakout groups will have a moderator that's a, a board member um, of BCDA. Um, and we're just going to walk through a series of a few questions so that we can workshop some ideas and then bring them back to the full group. So we'll walk through the questions. What are the biggest challenges you face today and or priorities for recovery and transformation? They're going to work as a group to then actually decide to take five quick minutes to say what are the ones we want to workshop today and then spend 10 minutes identifying some strategies together and brainstorming strategies um, that you could bring back to the group and we'll come back we're automatically going to um, come back in about 23 minutes here i think you'll get a little countdown in your group uh, and i'll put these questions in the chat too but um and then we're going to have the moderators just share back a couple of the strategies when we come back together so in a moment here, I'm going to open the rooms. Hopefully everyone gets where they need to be and we'll see you in about 20 minutes. <laughs>